I'm super excited to uh, have Liang Huang uh, today for our distinguished lecture. He's a professor at the Oregon State University, and he's been also a uh, distinguished scientist at Baidu until recently, uh, but more recently he is now uh, co-founder of Coderna as well. Um, and what's really striking about Liang's research is that he's finding some unexpected commonality between computational linguistics and computational biology, such that he's using algorithms that used to be used for parsing language uh, for designing mRNA vaccines and actually making it work. So um, in doing so, I'm also psyched to see that ChatGPT is not being used for that uh, as we keep hearing on and on for other problem solving. So this is a really nice uh, problem where uh, ChatGPT is not necessarily the best solution and there's something even better that's intellectually interesting. Um, you know, when I was a PhD student, I remember seeing Liang's talk, uh, something called the forest parsing. It was beautiful work, really beautiful work that, you know, as a student back then, I thought, oh, parsing algorithms, you know, you learn this and you learn that and maybe everything is solved. But then he came up with the even better algorithm that was just, you know, beautifully done. And I see something like this happening again for entirely different problems. So I'm super excited to hear more about that. So here you go. Thank you, Yejin. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Yejin, for inviting me to give this talk. I'm super excited and, and to, to see you all. And, uh, Today, I will tell you, I will try to convince you that linguistics and biology, even though they look completely irrelevant and different on the surface, they are actually the uh, two sides of the same coin. Uh, and under the hood, they actually share the same mathematical foundation that is formal language theory, like conics free grammar, parsing albums, and so on and so forth. So as Yeji mentioned, uh, even though a lot of people are working on in the intersection of language and biology, I'm kind of unique in the sense that I don't use any of the deep learning uh, or a chat GPT or la large language model for, for that kind of uh, interest, uh, uh, interdisciplinary work. My view is still very classical, so I'm a more of a theoretical computer scientist. I develop fast algorithms uh, deeply rooted in, in theory, uh, like in uh, mathematical linguistics, theoretical computer science, and apply them to RNA biology. Uh, so, but, well, you probably don't know me, but, but you, you probably know my first PhD student. I think almost everybody have, has read his, his paper. So he's actually my, my first PhD student, much, much more famous than I'm. And, but sometimes I'm a, a bit jealous, but, uh, but this is the way it should be, right? Your student's supposed to be better than you. Otherwise, it worse progress, right? So I'm very glad. Um, and uh, there's a little bit of personal story uh, how I kind of enter this field from computational linguistics, my original field. So as you mentioned, when I was doing my PhD on computational linguistics, my advisor at the time uh, wanted me to work on the application of natural language uh, processing to biology. Because he noticed that he r r randomly read a paper uh, from somewhere else which applied his grammar, which, made for, which was made for language, to say protein and RNA structures. He was very amazed and he was like, wow. He was already in his 70s and he said, I should do biology now using language. And he hired a few students to work on them, and I was one of them. But it was a, it was a disaster, actually, at that time, because it was way ahead of its time. And, and all of us who work on this love language so much that we all wanted to just work on natural language processing. So I, I, I hated it, and frankly speaking. I published uh, a couple of papers, and, and my advisor was like, yeah, there's not enough to, to report to NSF, so I can let you do whatever you want from now on. So I, I left it completely to just work on NLP for my thesis, and I was very happy. Um, and for about 10 years, I just worked on parsing and translation algorithms. But something very unexpected happens. When I moved to Oregon State, after 10 years of, of, of this you know, NLP or NLP research, uh, a biophysics and biochemistry colleague came to me, asked me a random question. I said, do you know this thing called stochastic conics free grammars, which we use for model, modeling RNA structures? I was like, yeah, that's exactly what my advisor wanted me to work on for my thesis, except that I just didn't really do it. I just gave it up. But by the time he asked me that question, I suddenly had a eureka moment. I was like, wait a minute. All these 10 years of parsing algorithms and natural language research can be totally applied to biology, and the impact will be bigger than, than the, the impact on, biology, on, on language. Why? Because the sequences or the sentences in biology are much, much longer 
than the sentences we had in natural language. For example, COVID is a very, very long viral genome which has 30,000 nucleotides. So in other words, it's a sentence of 30,000 words. You never get sentences that, are that long, right? And you need very fast linear time algorithms like we had in natural language to kind of fold and parse uh, RNA structures. So that's why the impact of my algorithms will be bigger if we uh, I, I adapt them to biology. And so starting from 2016, I, I came back to biology and I, I did a few papers before COVID. But, but that was just a side project within my lab. My lab is still mostly NLP, but COVID changed everything. So starting from COVID, I kind of refocused my, my lab to, uh, towards uh, biology. And we, we were very lucky that we, we published both in Nature and PNAS uh, in, in during COVID years. And today I'm going to talk about uh, th those, those papers in, in a bit more detail. And, but before that, because I realize most of the audience probably is, is in computer science, so maybe I need a little bit of intro of why RNA or RNA folding or RNA structures. Well, RNA is actually more important than DNAs or proteins. I, at least I argue that way because RNAs can do the work that DNA and proteins can do, but DNA can only do informational work. That is, DNA is like a CEO in a company, and protein is like, like regular employees, the workforce, which does real work. But RNA can do both. RNAs are like managers or, or directors, which you, know, you can do both informational message passing, which like messenger RNAs, or functional roles like non-coding RNAs. Uh, so if you're a messenger RNA, then you're, you're in the middle step between DNA and protein. Um, but that's very important because you, know, you have mRNA vaccines. But if you're a non-coding RNA, then the structure is more important because the structure determines function. And because we care about structure, so there is a little clip on you know, folding. So it's essentially, it, it was a very long sequence, but then it starts to fold in nature, just like sentences. We, we understand sentences because sentences have syntactic structures. In, essentially, they fold. Like you, you can imagine the words of the sentence, English sentence can fold, very similar to, to RNA fold and protein folding. And also because our world was turned up, kind of upside down by an RNA virus, uh, COVID, and all the other, most of the very, very bad viruses like HIV, fluke, uh, Ebola, whatever, rabies, are RNA viruses. So RNA viruses are very, very important. And this COVID is partly contained by messenger RNA vaccine, which got a Nobel Prize this year. So in my talk, I will refer to the Nobel Prize work by Katalin Carrico mostly, and then Drew, Drew Weissman. And a very funny story at the end of my talk uh, that I, I recently met uh, with Katalin uh, uh, in, in a conference, and it was a very, very funny story. Um, and so, yeah, why RNA folding is just like natural language parsing? Well, as I said, uh, you have a very long sequence, but then you fold in nature so that the beginning and the end actually are very, very close uh, in space. So, so like this. Uh, and this is just like the secondary structure, which is really just a parse tree. It's just a recursive hierarchical structure, right? And because it's a parse tree, we want to model it using context-free grammars like we used to do for natural language, like the English syntax, right? And because it's really just natural language par problem, parsing problem, so there is a lot of parallels between English or Chinese and RNA or protein. So sentences are sequences and syntactic structures are secondary structures or tertiary structures. And parsing is just folding. And we've been doing CKY parsing, which is classical algorithm in natural language processing since like 1965. It's cubic time and is the sequence length. It's bottom up dynamic programming algorithm. You know what, they use the same algorithm. It, it, but without knowing, uh, we invented it like a long time ago. They reinvented that album uh, in their field, uh, conducive enough, album 1980, about 15, it's always like biology is about 15 years uh, like behind NLP. And nowadays it's very obvious. Uh, and they essentially use the same album for about 40 years without knowing that our field has moved on uh, because this is way too slow. Uh, when, when, whenever N is big, like say for COVID, N is 30,000. You cannot afford to do cubic time folding there. So I invented linear time parsing with dynamic programming back like more than 10 years ago in natural language. I just, you know, after my colleague asked me that question, random question, I just realized that, you know, it's very easily applicable to RNA folding. So we got the first linear time incremental folding algorithm. Yeah, incremental is very important because as you hear me speak right now, you're doing incremental parsing. You don't wait until I finish a sentence and hit a button and say parse, right? Because the prefix of a sentence starts to parse uh, automatically. And the prefix of RNA or protein start to fold automatically. You cannot say, hold on, hold on, you cannot fold because you're not complete yet. And once you're complete, hit a button and say fold now, right? No, the chemistry doesn't allow you to do that. The chemistry automatically folds the, the, the prefix. 
right? So it's very similar to, to our uh, incremental parsing approach. And I'll just go very briefly, because that's not a, the important part of the, the talk. How do you fold RNAs in linear time? Uh, this is really the same thing as how do you fold, how do you parse in sentences in linear time? You go scan the sequence from left to right, and because it's a recursive structure, you, you can have a stack, you could either push or pop or skip. But that naive algorithm has exponential complexity, three to the n, uh, the whole space, but you can do dynamic programming by packing equivalent states. Uh, so I don't go into te technical details. Technical details are more complicated. So the, but the important thing is from three to the n, exponential to n to the three polynomial. And on top of this cubic space, you do beam search, which achieves linear time. But that, that's approximate now. You cannot guarantee um, exactness, right? But because it's beam search on top of this dynamic programming space, in other words, it's already reduced space from the exponentially large original space. So this beam search is much more efficient than a normal beam search. And each DP dynamic programming state here corresponds to like millions and millions of the original non-packed, uh, non-dynamic programming states. And that's why even with beam search, we can actually explore exponentially more many alternatives. Like normal beam search cannot do that. Like if you just do like chat GPT, they do beam search as well, but they can only allow like say 10 or 20 alternatives uh, but we can allow millions and billions of alternatives. And that's why it works really well. Well, speed-wise, of course, no, no need to say like one hour to half a minute uh, for COVID. Um, but accuracy-wise, if you just compare to ground truth structures, like, like kind of tree banks uh, in nature, they actually, our linear time algorithm is slightly more accurate uh, than, than the exact search algorithm, especially on longer, longer sequences, longest families. Uh, in, in the database and also on long range base pairs. Long range base pairs are like very far apart on the sequence, but close by in the structure, right? So it's all, throughout this talk, it's always far apart uh, on the surface, but close by in the structure, like it, both in language and biology. Uh, this is because our models are not very accurate. So if your model is perfect, then you want to do the best search possible. But because our models, like machine learning models, whatever, scoring functions are never perfect, so sometimes you do slightly worse search, or in, in other words, um, more regularized search, you actually can get better. But that, that we observe both in language parsing and RNA folding. OK, but, but that's the pre-story, pre-history of this talk. The exciting part of this talk starts when COVID hits in January of 2020. And I already knew at, in January 2020 that my work is going to, to help a little bit because this is RNA virus, right? Uh, and I was doing RNA folding before pandemic. But I wanted to do something more direct to help the pandemic, to help fight the pandemic. So I asked my friend, Riju Das from Stanford Medical School, how can my our work help? I mean, he has been using my algorithm like linear fold and linear partition for a few years before the pandemic. Uh, and, I, and he's in medical school, so I thought he, he would have some idea. Initially, he said, no, I have no idea. But then after a week, I got an email said, I've got a great idea. Come to Stanford, we'll talk. <laughs> so, so because everybody at, in January of 2020 was rushing to, to try to help humanity, right? Because people are dying, really. So I, I went to Stanford with my students, and he gave me a two-hour lecture on mRNA vaccine. I, I, I have no biology background. I know nothing about vaccine. I knew no, nothing about like flu vaccine or whatever, and not to mention mRNA vaccine, right? Nobody knew about an mRNA vaccine back in 2020. Um, but he told me about that, and he said, well, the biggest problem is stability. You know, mRNA vaccines are great, but you, you gotta solve stability problem. Uh, and, and that's how he introduced me to, to this world. And yeah, so, so we all know that MRI vaccines are much better than traditional flu, like, like protein vaccines, like flu shots, because it gives, for us computer scientists, MRI vaccines are source code, right? Protein vaccines, like flu shots, are executables, the you know, EXE files or whatever. So your cell is responsible for compiling the source code of the mRNA vaccine into proteins, which is the executable files. So, so that's why it's much faster in mass production, no risk in infection, and blah, 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 a lot of advantages, but with one catch, that it, mRNA vaccines are relatively unstable because RNAs, unlike DNAs, are mostly single-stranded. Uh, DNAs are kind of double-stranded, so it's kind of harder to cut down. And RNAs are single-stranded, more like naked, uh, so it's easier to degrade, and once it degrades, you would produce less spike proteins that you wanted. And in turn, you got less antibodies uh, induced. You got less protection. Right, so his question was, how do you design computationally more stable and efficient mRNA sequences that can translate to the same spike protein that you wanted, but you know, stay much longer in, in, in your cells? 
right? So that was our question. And so it's actually a very simple mathematical problem for us computer scientists. Well, the problem set up is very easy, but to solve it is not highly non-trivial. Well, so protein translation works like this. Uh, so for, for those of you, um, I, I can introduce a little bit of biology background. So if you, when you translate from mRNA, messenger RNA, to, to protein, you, you group them by three. So each group of three consecutive nucleotides forms a codon, which translates to one amino acid. Right? And this is the genetic code table, so you can just look up. Oh, if you have GCG, then you've got alanine, whatever, whatever, right? So this process of translation is deterministic. But the inverse problem of design is non-deterministic. Why? Because there are 64 triplet codons for 20 amino acids. So there are only 20 amino acids, but in order to encode the 20 amino acids, you need at least three triplet codons, or uh, three nucleotides, because two is four to the power of two, is 16 and not enough. You need four to the power of three, which is 64, but then you got too much. You got some redundancy. So a lot of the uh, amino acids have multiple codons to, to translate to, right? So for example, uh, valine, you can do any of these four. Leucine, you can do any one of these six. You can, you can cho choose whatever you want. And if you multiply the number of choices together, and because you have such a long spike protein of, of 20, uh, of like over 1,000 amino acids, you got a humongous number. You got a combinatorial explosion, exponentially large search space. And these sequences, these MRA sequences are all, all valid vaccine sequences. They are all paraphrases of each other because they are synonymous. They all translate to the same protein that you wanted. But which one should you choose to, to inject into people's arms, right? So very funny thing is that Moderna published a paper right before the pandemic, December of 2019, PNAS, suggesting that you should choose, you should find the most stable MRA sequence among all these ocean of alternatives. Why? Because it stays longer, so it produces more proteins naturally, right? But the question is really how to find the most stable sequence in this huge space. You cannot enumerate them one by one. And that would take billions and billions of years. So in Regis' office in Stanford, he's, you know, I said, you know, maybe I can probably solve it. You know, I don't know yet, but, but I have a rough idea. He said, forget about it. He said, you know, it's MP hard. No, 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 you have no hope. And I was like, maybe it's not, you know, but, but I was not too sure. So after a few weeks, I, I kind of solved it, and he was, eventually he was convinced. But uh, eventually I, I realized that even though I, I kind of solved it with a new album, it's actually not inventing a new album. It's actually a classical album in natural energy processing that I found to be equivalent to. Uh, and I'll tell you a bit more about that. But do stop me if you have any questions. I, I can take any questions. Uh, you know, I, I, I like to be more interactive. Um, and so I borrowed two ideas from classical AI or, or natural language processing or theoretical computer science to solve this problem. The first one is called a lattice, or in, in computer science it's called DFA, deterministic finite state automaton, which is just a kind of a graph, a derived graph with edges being labeled by ACGUs, the nucleotides. So for example, you have two choices here. You just pa pack it into this little graph. Four choices for valine. You know, it's just the, the third letter that has the ambiguity and so on and so forth. Leucine has, has more alternatives, has six. You, you just pack it here and blah, blah, blah. And stop codon, you have three, right? So each, each amino acid, you have a little DFA and then or lattice, and you stitch all these little DFAs together, you've got a very, very long kind of narrow DFA or, or mRNA lattice. In this lattice, each path from the beginning to the end represents a valid vaccine sequence, right? So there are 10 to the power of 600 something path, right? But that does not solve the problem at all. It's just a change of representation. Really, we should ask the question, how do you find the most stable path in that DFA, right? Or in other words, in, in physics, we want to say the lowest free energy, because the lowest free energy means the most stable, right? So, yeah, so here comes the next idea, which is more important to solve this question. The second idea is also from nat natural language processing called lattice parsing. And the idea is like when we do speech recognition in the past, at least, uh, we were not able to hear clearly uh, whether it's a veal or meal uh, in isolation of context. So it's probably you just hear this little window, this either view or meal, I cannot tell. But with context, you can say, oh, with language models or whatever, then you can say, oh, I like this meal, it's more likely than, than the, I like this view or other alternatives, right? So there's an algorithm called lattice parsing, which kind of folds or parse all the sentences in this lattice simultaneously without enumerating one by one. 
and you just need a grammar, like English language grammar, like modeling grammaticality. And then lattice parsing will tell you, oh, the most likely sequence or most grammatical sequence is I like this meal with the synthetic structure. Okay? And this is a very efficient dynamic programming algorithm uh, invented in 1961. Actually, the, that's the funny part. 60 years before the pandemic. And I just used the same algorithm. I just reduced the new pandemic algorithm, pandemic area uh, problem of MRE design to a classical algorithm 60 years ago. Same algorithm, just changed the ingredients, right? The ingredients are now, instead of word lattice, you got MRE lattice. Instead of English grammar, you got RNA folding grammar, which encodes stability instead of grammaticality. And then you were able to fold all these vast ocean of alternatives in like about just 10 minutes, you can find the most stable MRA sequence um, along with its secondary structure, right? So in other words, the algorithm itself does not change. It's just uh, you know, we reduce the new problem into a familiar old problem. So that, that was completely unexpected. And for, for computer scientists in this audience, so there's a deep connection with theoretical computer science because what we do it has a, you know, it's actually taught in, no, I, I teach like theoretical computer science, like theory of computation, and a graduate course has something called like intersection of context-free grammar, uh, context-free language with a regular language and so on and so forth. But uh, for natural language processing, uh, NLP folks in this audience, lattice parsing you might n not be familiar with, but it's just a very simple generalization of CKY, standard classical parsing algorithm from a single sequence to a graph, to a DFA, or to a lattice, right? And you can view CKY as a special case of lattice parsing where the graph is a single chain, is a degenerate case. And the funny part in history is that, that's, that's very, very ironical, uh, that CKY is published by CK and Y, three different people like Koch, Kasami, and Younger around 1964, 1965. But it actually is a special case of something published earlier in 1961 called Bachilel construction. Bachilel, no, nobody knows Bachilio now, but, but Bachilio is a pioneer of machine translation in our field. Uh, and this is the original reference. But um, for theoretical people in this audience, uh, the other interpretation is you want to prove that the intersection of context-free language with a regular language is also context-free. We know that context-free languages are not closed under intersection, right? Regular languages are closed under intersection. Context-free is not. But if you come intersect a context-free language with a regular language, you got another bigger context-free language. I mean, smaller in, in, in size, but bigger in terms of grammar. And that's essentially what we do. Um, so this, yeah, this is, this context-free language is the scoring function. The regular language is the lattice, the, the MRI folding, uh, the MRI design lattice. Yeah, so it's very, very interesting. Yeah, and you can see CKY is IJK, cubic in length, and lattice parsing is PQR, the states or, or nodes in the, in the graph which is cubic in the size of the lattice. So same thing, it's very simple. Oh yeah, he, he would know that his algorithm will be used for 60 years later. Uh, and now, now I can give you some results um, by, for biology folks in the audience. Um, so without our optimization, the wild type sequence in the geno viral genome is very unstable. It has a structure with a lot of single-stranded regions, like this red parts are single-stranded, unpaired parts, which get easily cut down because they are single-stranded. Whereas our design, after about 11 minutes, we designed a very different sequence, but they are synonymous. They both encode or translate to the same spike protein. Um, but you got a very different sequence with a very different structure. So it's mostly double-stranded. In a way, you kind of turn an RNA into a DNA, right? Because if you have double-stranded, like, like a braid, then it's much harder to, to cut down, right? And we can prove mathematically that this is the most stable or, or lowest free energy sequence among all these 10 to the power of 600 some alternatives. And this was done, you know, it started in January, but this was done in April. Everybody was rushing really hard to help fight the pandemic. And after we released our preprint, many like, pharmaceutical companies noticed it. And they, they talked to us and they wanted to do experiments for us. And we part, chose to partner with uh, Stamina Therapeutics in Shanghai. It's uh, one of the leading companies in China. They volunteered to do experiment, all the experiments for us. And their experiments are very surprising, uh, even to them. They show that our design can lead to more than a hundredfold in increase in antibody response compared to standard techniques used by BioNTech, Pfizer, Moderna, and everybody else in the industry. Uh, and uh, it's significantly better than BioNTech Pfizer sequence, 
uh, in, in binding and antibody response because one of the reviewers asked us to compare with the Pfizer sequence because Pfizer everybody got Pfizer sequence, right? And the editor asked us to compare with uh, to to show it on another vaccine, so we did it on a, another virus and also works, right? So just some um, details. Uh, so actually, we are doing two-dimensional joint optimization. I was talking about just one dimension, the first dimension. That's the x-axis. The x-axis is the free energy. You want it the lower, the better. In other words, you want to move to the left. And the more negative, the better, because the more negative, the, the, the more stable. But we also have another dimension, which is very important. That's the translation efficiency. So x-axis, basically, how long can you sustain? Right, the half-life stability. Y-axis is like how fast can you produce proteins. So this is like more like a long-distance runner, and if you push to the front, to the top, it's more like a sprint, a short-distance runner, right? So you want to. So it turns out that the uh, codons, each different codons for the same amino acid, they are you know equal, but they are not totally equal. Uh, e so like say for example for leucine, these all these six different codons translate to leucine, but the human genome prefers CUG, but this doesn't like CUA. So you want, to you want to use the frequent codons in a human genome and avoid rare codons. So that's, that's why, why you can do more efficient translation. Right? So you want to be good in both stability and efficiency. Right? So this is how many hours can you sustain. This is in the unit amount of time, like per hour, how much protein can you produce. Right? So there's a trade-off. Uh, you cannot be good in both. Right? So, so there's a boundary of limits, uh, the feasibility limit. You use a lambda to control how much you want the weight of the, the uh, code optimality dimension, or the CAI dimension. The, this means the if you're more code optimal, you, it means you use more uh, more frequent codons used by human genome. But the classical approach of code optimization only only does local search. Like for each amino acid, it says, "Oh, I would prefer CUG. I would not prefer CUA." You know, so these are all local search. Where we our approach is more global optimization, right? So, but their approach, even though they, they push towards the, the y-axis, they actually also improve the stability a little bit. Why? Because the human genome prefers GC-rich codons, and GC pairs are more stable you know, in physics than AU pairs. So as a byproduct, they improve the stability a little bit, just, just you know, coincidentally. But the two directions are mostly orthogonal. They have very large angle. So we were able to, you know, Go all the way to the to the left to the most very stable regions. I mean, Moderna actually knows that you should go left. That's why they published that paper, uh, but they don't know how to go to the left, right? So they tried a lot of local mutations, and it's a very big cloud of like millions of alternatives, but they cannot cross this dashed line. Crossing this dashed line needs millions of years if you don't have our algorithm, right? So, yeah. And we did experiments. No, I mean, I didn't do the experiments. The, the folks in Shanghai did the experiments. Uh, and it's very interesting that uh, this native gel run and half-life is about stability. It correlates with our theoretical calculations of free energy really well. right? So A, which we predict to be the most stable with lowest free energy, runs the fastest. Because if you're more compact in shape, you, you're more like spherical. It runs the fastest. If you're loose, then you you, you, you runs the slowest. Like H, the baseline, runs the slowest, followed by G. And DEF has similar free energy, and they run in similar speed. They correlate so well with ex between experiments and our theoretical calculations. And half-life as well, right? The half-life, uh, the H baseline has only four hours, and our A has 20 hours, right? So, and they correlate with free energy very, very well. And as a result of the increased half-life, you have produced more proteins. So protein expression, we also are much, much better than H, uh, actually about uh, threefold better than, than, than the baseline. And more importantly, the antibody results are very striking. Binding antibody, 128-fold better than baseline. Neutralizing antibody, 20 times better than the baseline. All right, so they're very, very surprising. And yeah, one of the reviewers, as I mentioned, asked us to compare with, uh, so when, when this is submitted to Nature, uh, you know, Nature reviewers could be very, very harsh, right? So one of the reviewers said, you know, everybody nowadays got either Moderna or Pfizer sequence. You should compare with one of them. Uh, and that's quite harsh, right? Because actually the other reviewer said, you know, that's a bit unfair. That, that, this Pfizer sequence is a very successful product that a lot of people in the United States got. And this is a research project. How can they compare? But nevertheless, we still, we still took the pain of doing a head-to-head -head comparison. That's a fair comparison. 
with everything being equal, just the difference is the, the coding region sequence. We took the Pfizer biotech sequence. Uh, and on this plot of the MSU free energy and the CAI index, they're actually very, very close. And indeed, in terms of half-life, the Pfizer biotech sequence is very, very close to our baseline, a, a little bit worse, because actually energy-wise, it's indeed a little bit worse. Yeah, we've predicted that, and it's confirmed by experiments. But surprisingly, protein expression, they're much better than our baseline age. And antibody, they're also much, much better than our baseline age, but still worse, significantly worse than our designs. Also for protein expression, very significantly worse than our designs. So this suggests that Pfizer BioNTech definitely has some other dimensions, hidden dimensions, latent dimensions that are metrics that they didn't publish as their trade secrets. You know, they didn't want to share with us. But um, just by these two most important dimensions, we, uh, our baseline is very close to that, but there are so many other, um, you know, factors to consider that we did not know about, right? If we knew about their, their other dimensions, we could probably imp improve even more, right? But that's, that's very interesting. Uh, and the editor of Nature is an um, immunologist. So he said, you know, you only showed COVID. You might be just lucky on COVID. In order to show the generality of this algorithm, it should be applicable to any virus, right? Definitely show us uh, another one. So we, we just showed another virus, virus or zoster virus, VZV, and it worked equally equally well. So this is very, very good. So just to summarize this part, uh, so we showed that classical AI uh, NLP algorithm, even though it's dead now in natural energy processing, nobody knows all these things that I talked about. Uh, in ACL, nobody does those. Even I don't do those kind of work in uh, NLP. Uh, I kind of found a new life, an unexpected new life for, the, for them in a completely different field, right? And and I'll talk about chemical modification, which is the Nobel Prize uh, work. Um, and it can be used beyond vaccines as well. And Sanofi is one of the most uh, biggest pharmaceutical companies already licensed this technology two years ago. Uh, and we were published in Nature. And also, they, they wrote a news article, uh, like Remarkable AI Tool, blah, 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 and also a commentary. So um, yeah, the funny thing is, you know, in October this year, we know that this uh, MRA vaccine work won the Nobel Prize uh, because it, it was used a lot in COVID. Uh, it was mostly Kathleen Carrico's work. Uh, her career was, was really miserable, but, but her, her life is so inspiring. You, you, I recommend you read his, uh, her, her autobiography. It's extremely good. Uh, just right after she got the Nobel Prize, uh, announced the Nobel Prize, she co-organized a conference in Berlin called MRA, its annual conference of MRA Health Conference and invited me to give a talk about this work. And I gave a talk, and then she gave a keynote after my talk. And the funny thing is that she actually referred to my work in her talk, uh, but in a, in a joking way, in, in a very funny way. Um, but I, I probably, you, I, can, I can tell you more about it if you're very interested. Uh, but, but her work uh, is purely chemical, because he, she's a biochemist. And my work is purely in silico or algorithmic. They can be combined. They should be orthogonal and, and, and complementary. Yeah, so we are working on combining the two for future vaccines. Uh, and we build a web server that you can use. Um, and yeah, any questions for the first half? Yes. When you do your folding algorithm yeah. or your optimization algorithm, do you take into account uh, structures that are not the MFE structure or base pairing probabilities, or is it just optimization of MFE? Yeah, that's a very, very deep question. Uh, so yes, indeed. Uh, I did not have time to talk about the partition function of, uh, part of my work, which we already did. Uh, so, so as you know, proteins and RNAs fold into different structures uh, at the same time, right? So maybe 30% in this structure, 20% in that structure. It's a distribution. It's a Boltzmann distribution. I also have work in that space called linear partition. But in this work of our MR design, I only consider M MFE structure, the, the most free, lowest free energy structure. But in the current work, uh, well, which I'm doing, uh, we also consider other structures in, in the partition function. But that's more complicated, yeah. Thank you. Yes? Yeah, I was going to ask the exact same thing, but then just looking at the structure that resulted, which is nice. Yeah. It would be surprising if the partition function didn't vary around what the MFE looked like anyway, because it was so linear. Yeah, but, but you know what? Uh, my, my collaborator, Dave Matthews, whom you know very well, uh, suggested that we should make an MRA which has a slightly flatter distribution uh, so that it's more, it's not like hard as rock. Like just like if you do want to design proteins, you don't want to design proteins that which has only one shape. You want it had to, to, be, to be kind of switching to other shapes, like, like a bit plastic, 
so that you can change shape as you need. Because when you go through, the, the ribosome goes through the mRNA, uh, it needs the mRNA to fold and unfold, fold and unfold. So it needs to be more flexible in shape, but still stable. So you want to, in other words, minimize the, or maximize the partition function but instead of uh, just MFE. Yeah, but that's a very deep technical question. Yeah, thank you for asking that. That's something we are doing right now, but any other questions? Okay, very good. I'll go to the second half. The second half is much, much shorter than the first um, because uh, it's you know, no longer about vaccines. It's now onto diagnostics and therapeutics. So here, we want to detect COVID and to potentially develop drugs for, uh, for COVID. So, oh yeah, so th this is the, the one, one more uh, application. So I talked about parsing, incremental parsing, lattice parsing for design, incremental parsing for folding, and there's also something called synchronous parsing uh, for the next uh, part, which is you wanna, you know, in natural language processing, you have a task in machine translation where you have English and Chinese, translations of each other, and you wanna fold or parse their syntactic structure together with the word alignment. This task is a classical task called synchronous parsing. Uh, it was very popular when I was a PhD student. Nobody does that anymore. And then, so, uh, very interesting, I realized that same problem is, is being studied in, in biology, where you would, you would fold and align different SARS-CoV-2 variants like Omicron and Delta, or, or kind of rel related sequences like SARS-CoV-2 versus SARS-CoV-1. And they're kind of highly related, they're, they're similar. I mean, they're, you know, there was, they're s s translations of each other. They're, they're kind of close relatives, but they have slightly different structures. And if you fold them together, instead of folding them alone one by one, you got a better accuracy, right? Because basically they tell you, yeah, we tend to be similar in structure and so on and so forth, right? So this is the, another work that I published in PNAS um, uh, two years ago, yeah. So the goal of this work is to try to find the Achilles heels, the vulnerable regions of the viral genome. Why? Because they want to, we want to target those regions for diagnostics and therapeutics. Um, more specifically, we want to find conserved, highly conserved and highly accessible regions. Conserved is like it doesn't change uh, in, in evolution, right? Because so, we know COVID has so many mutations. A lot of places got changed, and as, as it got changed, uh, the original primers, the PCR primers, which we use for, for detecting COVID, got less and less sensitive. So this is the China CDC primers. As time goes on, because China CDC primers was made uh, in, January, like in January of 2020 when the, the first Wuhan virus, right? So there was no mutation, but once you have more and more mutations like Delta and Omicron, it got less and less effective or sensitive because chances are those primary regions got mutated uh, with time. Right, whereas our, we can see at the end, our design is very, very, remains very effective. Why? Because we want to target the conserved regions where the virus does not afford, cannot afford to change. Because the virus itself tried to mutate randomly uniform, in uniform probability everywhere. But some positions you just cannot afford because you change it, it dies, right? The other places you can keep kind of innovating, like a spike protein, you can keep changing. But there are other more critical places you cannot afford to change. Right, so first, conserved. Secondly, not only conserved, but also accessible, meaning single-stranded, unpaired regions, right? So in the first half of this talk, we want more paired as structure as possible. Here, we want to target, we want to target unpaired regions, single-stranded regions, why? Because you know, it's easier to cut down into pieces, right? You can design a small molecule or other you know, RNAs to, to kind of bind to it, uh, so, but you don't want to target this kind of double-stranded regions because you know, they're, they're protected, right? But these two goals are contradictory to each other because if you're a double-stranded part of the genome, then you are more likely to be conserved. Because in order to change a C to an A, this corresponding G will change to a U. Right? So it's like parity, right? It's like you have zero to one and one to zero. But single-stranded regions, you know, there's no check. There's no parity bit. You can change whatever you want, right? So this is actually very, very hard. It's easier, much easier to find just conserved and just accessible, but very hard to find both at the same time. But that's both. If you achieve both, that's the very best targets for, for test kits and for drugs. Okay, and we want our test kits and drugs to be insensitive to existing and future mutations because we cannot predict what kind of new variants will come up tomorrow. But we, want, we don't want to redesign a new drug when, say, Omicron comes up. We want our test kits to be 
remaining effective because we not, cannot predict, right? And to be more sensitive to existing primers on the market, right? The method, the pr approach we do that is called homologous folding, which is basically synchronous parsing. But in the, in the, instead of languages, we jointly fold and align many SARS-CoV-2 variants and related genomes like SARS-CoV-1, bat coronavirus, coronavirus on other animals, and so on and so forth. They are you know, sometimes distant relatives. And they share some common ancestor like maybe 100 years ago. Uh, and this is similar to synchronous parsing that I talked about. So we can still use linear time parsing to solve this problem. And we did. So previous approaches uh, were not able to scale to COVID because they, can, they were not efficient enough. They can only do local folding, like a sliding window. Like whenever you do like G GPU stuff, you often current deep learning stuff is often do, uh, using a sliding window approach. Like say, you can only allow 100 or 500 nucleotides to, to pair with each other, but then you have a sliding window. But that's not good enough. We want to have the end-to-end -end structures, global structures. And because even though the COVID genome is very, very long, the two ends, the five prime and the three prime ends, tend to be very close uh, in distance uh, in nature when they fold. So you definitely want to kind of have the whole ability to, pop, to fold the whole sequence together. But nobody was able to do that before. So we were able to do that using natural language processing. Uh, and this is linear time, global, and homologous, meaning con considering many different related sequences. And in fact, we can fold five prime, the, the beginning and the end part of the genome together. And you know what? There was another work, purely experimental work, that you know, using completely different approach in chemistry or whatever, that has exactly the same structure uh, with our prediction, pair by pair. Not even a single pair is different. It matches exactly with their experimental approach. And we're very, very surprised by that. And this is almost 3,000 nucleotides apart. You can imagine, like, it's very, very hard to, to predict their correspondence, their, their pairing. And we use that to find the conserved and accessible regions, which is basically the vulnerable Achilles heels. Uh, so we want you know, accessible and conserved, and also conserved on distant relatives like SARS-CoV-1, because historically, if this part of, of the viral genome does not change throughout history, then chances are in the future it doesn't change, right? So that's why we want to look at related genomes as well, because if you just look at SARS-CoV-2 variants, well, SARS-CoV-2 has only been around for three years. There's not enough time to, to change too much. It's within 1% of, of difference, or even less. But if you look at SARS-CoV-1, which is about uh, 20 years ago, another SARS coronavirus in China, which is about 79, 78% similarity with SARS-CoV-2, and so on and so forth. So in the end, we were able to find 30, some 33 regions uh, which are conserved and accessible on the genome, but none of them is on the spike protein. That's, that actually makes sense, because spike pro protein is the fastest evolving region of the virus, because you need to keep in, uh, innovating on that. And the funny part is that our paper was published before Omicron, and somehow it stood the test of time when Omicron came along. So when Omicron came along, my students went back to check our results. Uh, we prescribed 33 regions, and our 33 conserved and accessible regions, nothing is on spike, and none, none of these regions were changed uh, in Omicron. So Omicron had a lot of mutations, like a lot, uh, over 100 compared to the original Wuhan virus, but a lot of them are on spike because uh, they, they need to be efficient in entering your cells. But, uh, but other parts of the viral genome are more critical, right? So this suggests that our, predict, our regions, which you've made drugs for them or, or, or test kits for them uh, from, based on these, they are likely immune to future mutations or variants, which we cannot predict. So that's very interesting. So just to conclude, I think, uh, I hope I convinced you guys that linguistics and biology are two sides of the same coin, and I have lots of other parallels which I didn't have time to talk about. For example, the partition function, which people ask about. Uh, there's inside-outside algorithm in natural language processing. Same algorithm after about 10 years were invented in RNA biology. Again, it's always like reinventing the same algorithm without knowing that we have been already doing that for many, many years, and a linear partition and so on and so forth. Many, many other, other stuff, exciting stuff that I didn't have time to talk about. And just uh, some you know, future work or current work. So I've been trying to combine Catalin's Nobel Prize work of chemically modified RNAs to design better chem chemically modified new, uh, RNAs. Uh, that, that's actually quite uh, interesting and, uh, and important because chances are like maybe 10 years later, everybody will be doing both because uh, these two are totally orthogonal algorithms and chemistry. Uh, and also for therapeutics uh, and other modalities like circular RNA, not just for vaccines. And another branch of my work in biology is non-coding RNA design. So I started with this picture, because you have 
MRA, the informational role, and non-coding RNA, the structural role. So, so this is similar to protein design, uh, which you know this university is the best in the university, like because of the Baker Lab. Uh, so we have similar problem RNA design or, or non-coding RNA design. Given a particular structure, you want to find a sequence that can naturally fold into it. Right? So this is much, much harder than the MRA design problem that I attacked here. Because MRA design, you don't need to fold into a specific structure. You just need to translate to a specific protein. So the search space is a regular language modeled as a DFA. Here, the search space is actually a context-free language. So the, the intersection of two context-free languages is not context-free. So this is much, much harder algorithm problem in theory. Uh, and it's inverse problem of, of folding. Right? Folding is like from structure produced uh, from Sequence predict structure, design is given structure, predict or design a sequence. That, the search space is much, much bigger. It's four to the n times n to, to the power of three, right? So, yeah, so very exciting time to, to be in this field uh, and to be in, in between linguistics and biology. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. If I could ask a very naive, high-level question, as someone who loves these 1960s, you know, formal languages results and knows nothing about the biology, sure. why would nature's sequences prefer to be context-free? Oh yeah, that's a very good question. That's uh, yeah. Actually, I, you know what? I, I guess uh, I gave the same talk at AI2 yesterday, and I got the same question from one of the AI2 folks. And yeah, that was a very deep question, actually. So uh, let me go back to the context-free grammar. So in fact, it's not context-free. Uh, the bulk part of the structures are context-free. There are small chances of crossing pairs, which are beyond context-free, which are mildly context-sensitive. Uh, but for this, for this talk, like for, for uh, MRA design, context-free is, is largely enough. Um, but if you want to really care about some specific structures, you need to go slightly beyond context-free, and then you go beyond n cubic, you need to n to the fourth, n to the fifth, those are much slower algorithms, and those, those are very challenging. And if you think about proteins, protein structures are more, con more beyond context-free than RNAs. RNAs are like, mostly context-free, a little bit uh, beyond context-free. Protein structures are largely beyond context-free because you can have parallel beta sheets, which is crossing, like cross zero is basically context-sensitive language, right? Yeah, so, so that, that's a very, very good question. Thank you. Yes? It's a very nice question, but uh, if the antibody response is so tremendously like two orders of magnitude higher, does that also kind of impact the side effects that people might have if they get the vaccine? Yeah, that's a very good question. So some of the, uh, the side effects come from lipid nanoparticles, which are the packaging of the, 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 the vaccine, not, not the inside, not the messenger, not the, not the source code. Uh, so if you produce too much protein, I don't know, maybe there's some side effects, like maybe some too much spike protein is bad for your for your heart or something, I, I don't know. Like there might be, yeah. So, 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 so I, I, I think, I think uh, Professor Fields uh, suggested that you want to do something slow release. He talked to me today, uh, slow release drugs, which kind of doesn't produce too much proteins very fast. But because our work is a long distance runner, right? We can be very stable, but we can reduce the running speed. You can say, oh yeah, just, just, you know, like jogging or whatever. You reduce a little bit of protein every day, but you can sustain much longer. Maybe, maybe that's the, that's another approach to avoid side effects. Yeah. Yeah, we should explore that. Thank you. Yeah. So you mentioned that the results of your kind of um, algorithmic method matched up with the experimental results yeah, for, right. for yeah. folding of, of COVID RNA. Yeah. Um, do you think, or have you tried to apply this to like maybe future viruses or other viruses? And do you think that could help yeah, yeah, speed so up yeah. response to? So, so as I said, the Nature Editor wanted us to at least show, show it another vaccine. So we, 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 we just had to do it. Actually, you know, the, just after we got a review, just to do extra experiments took like more than a year. Because this whole process took like three and a half years uh, from, from, from the beginning to, to, to getting it published in Nature. Uh, and uh, most time it was spent on wet lab experiments. I mean, I didn't do any of the experiments. Uh, the, the company did a lot of experiments for us. Uh, so we were talking about another vaccine, right? So yeah, so, so for, this vac uh, for this virus, we got very, very nice correlations with theoretical calculations as well. Yeah. I guess I was talking about the, the RNA side, like the second, the second set of slides. Oh, the second set of slides. Yeah, oh, you, yeah. Have you thought about applying? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Would yeah, it right, speed right, up, right, right. Would it speed up a response to a future pandemic or something? Right, 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 exactly. 
So like uh, uh, many, many other viruses are, most of the you know, important viruses are RNA viruses. So we can, yeah, yeah, actually people are working with me to, to, to do some you know, pandemic pre pre prevention kind of research, like not just for COVID, but for HIV, for, uh, any, uh, for, 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 for rabies or whatever. Yeah, so, so we can do this for, for other vac virus as well. Yes, totally, yeah, thank you, yes. So in the early parts of your slides, uh, you, uh, you just flashed by, there's this zone where this optimization works and you've got lambda equals affinity in this yeah. zone to the to the left to the left of that on the on the, on yeah. the slide yeah. does is it the um, in this region to the left uh -huh. I mean you you showed for example this baseline you're 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 getting something to the right there is a is there a fundamental reason why one wouldn't want to be looking in that you know this uh, in this zone uh, to the left there, you like in the upper this, left, yeah. Upper oh, left no, part. this part. Well, no, I mean, it's like D, like you have yeah, a D, D there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Why isn't D better than the baseline? Right, like, right, right. Higher, be better on, on, right. on both of the measures. Right, exactly, that's a very good question. In Moderna's paper, they suggest you need to be good in both dimensions. So maybe they suggest that there is some sweet spot some, somewhere here. And so it really depends on experiments. So we, we, we don't know, right? So, but in the other vaccine, indeed, we show that B, C, D, the three ones in the middle are the best. That that's the sweet spot. The, the, the most stable one, A, the fastest runner, E, are not as good, right? So the, the, yeah, that's the sweet spot. But we, we don't know a priori. You have to do, do experiments for that. Yeah, yeah. So because sometimes you want long distance runner a bit more. Sometimes you want a sprinter a little bit more. I, I don't know, yeah, yeah, yes. So you mentioned about how um, Research in the RNA design is yeah. like a decade or 15 years behind NLP research. Yeah. But now if you look at NLP, it's predominantly all about deep learning. Yeah. Um, and clearly you have designed algorithms here where it's having a huge amount of impacts. So I wanted to hear a bit about where you think algorithmic design would be impactful, the larger set of problems where it could be impactful, not just in, in this domain, but also in NLP. <laughs> yeah, that's a, that's a very good point. You say, you're just asking whether those classical algorithms would have any use. Well, I hope, I hope. I just, uh, nobody listens to me, but so like, <laughs> like this, this line of classical NLP research is dead in current ACL or, or other NLP conferences, right? Nobody actually does that. Nobody actually teaches that. A lot of, lot of these classical ones, like in Stanford, the, the, the uh, NLP class start, stopped teaching those classical algorithms. I was very sad, but but the, that professor said, you know, we haven't got no time for it. Uh, we, we have to teach more than deep learning stuff. It's more exciting. Yeah, but uh, I hope that somebody should combine the two, really. Because chat GPT and like, large language models do not have symbolic representation, really. It doesn't need to follow hard rules, right? So we should kind of combine the two, because they are good on something, like recall. We, our stuff is very good on precision, like as like the, the Elena was saying. Right, so some, some, somebody should be doing work on combining, like maybe Yejin is doing that already a lot, right? So it's combining the two. But, but those classical stuff should not be forgotten, I think, yeah. I, I think other people do teach it to some degree still, yeah. right? it's not like nobody's teaching, but... Yeah, um, yeah you teach uh, it still. Right? I, mean, I mean, okay, I, I think um, in NLP, it's true that parsing is a bit out the door, uh, or more than a bit out the door. And I, I wonder whether it's because the parsing problem is a little bit like somewhat artificial problem to begin yeah, with, whereas right. mRNA design, this is like a real problem. Right. Uh, so it's a bit different, I think. But That's, that's a very good but, point, yeah. But still, nonetheless, I do have a question sure. um, um, about the uh, dynamics between algorithms versus what actually goes under the algorithm, like implementation detail, uh -huh. because even for parsing, uh, regardless of how beautiful the algorithm is, you always have to have some local scoring function. Yeah. If that's powerful, then yeah, yeah. performance can go up so much so that sometimes you can get away with like approximate linear algorithm. Right, and, right. and so um, I wonder how much of that is critical for this mRNA uh, design as well, because I imagine that, I mean, you kind of mentioned that things are not entirely context to sense uh, free, free, which yeah, means yeah. Uh, you could actually empower the representation learning under the hood. And uh, do, do you have any comments about sure, that? Sure, that, that's a very good question. Thank you, Yejin. Uh, so in order to, for, for us to develop very fast algorithms like dynamic programming, you'd want the scoring function to factor into local structures. 
It doesn't need to be local on the surface, but it needs to be local on the structure. So for example here, you can be very far apart at the beginning and the end, but I can score a pair. As long as you're a pair, that means you're together, your structural distance is very small, even though your surface distance is huge. But the scoring function has to be local on structure. This is the same thing as the syntactic grammar we had on, on natural language. This is the same for RNA grammar uh, we had on, on this is the, the scoring function that we can give for um, give a free energy for any RNA. Right? So it turns out they, they, have, they have been using the same grammar, but just different parameters for, for RNA. Yeah, but if you, if you have a complete deep learning kind of a grammar or, or a large language model, then you cannot factor it. You cannot do efficient search with, with that. You cannot, you cannot factor into local structures, but you can probably do score more global context, right? Yeah, so, so, so there is a trade-off okay, between the two, right? Yeah, so so far one, uh, oh yeah, so question, sorry. Is there a 50-year-old algorithm <laughs> where you parse, uh, give you two sentences, yeah. and I have to transform one sentence into another, but each sentence has to be highly probable, meaning can I apply that to find an efficient algorithm to find folding pathways of rival switches and other things? Yeah, that, that's you something you, you were asking me this morning, right? So, but uh, <laughs> I don't know, yeah. I hope. Yeah, probably not, because there are some problems that we don't study in natural language, right? Yeah, so like RNA design or protein design is, is similar to uh, a generation problem in natural language, right? So, because folding is like parsing, like understanding, but the inverse direction is generation. Like, I have some semantic representation or meaning that I want to convey in natural language. How can you say it in, in a French sentence? That, that's the natural language generation problem, right? Yeah, but, uh, but, but the real problem is, is, is more involved. <laughs> I, I don't... Yeah, it, it also involves multiple sequences, so, so, so it's kind of more, maybe like a multilingual problem. I, I actually don't yeah. know. Yeah. Okay. I, yeah. It's like being at the UN, but I have to translate through every language oh, and sequence. Oh, wow. Yeah, um, that's right. Yeah. But that's I get right. good interpretation along every single oh, translation. Oh, I see, I see. Okay. Yeah, that's interesting to consider. Thank you. Okay, maybe we can now thank the speaker. Thank you.